Hi, Lewis and Clark Caverns offers an unusually complex and interesting geological history. So today we're going to talk about the big three most important stories there. So this is me. I have a bachelor's and master's degrees in geology. I studied the caverns for my master's thesis from Montana State University. I've been back a bunch of times and led a lot of field trips for university students, and I'm preparing a book to sell on the caverns geological history. I've also worked for 35 years as a professional geologist in the energy industry. We don't need to read all of these things, but I've had a lot of interesting experiences all around the world, some great uh, classes and field trips that help me tell this story. I'm very lucky to be married to Brenda. We have five kids and nine grand ears. Right now I'm carving a carousel rocking horse for the grandkids. I like to play the hammer dulcimer. Uh, I used to play basketball and volleyball, noontime lunches, but I'm not working now. My feet probably wouldn't put up with it anymore. Hope to ski some more, but didn't get to do it this year. And I get to teach science teachers workshops. I've done that on five continents so far. So here's how we're gonna start. Would you like to hear a story? Everybody likes stories, right? People in every culture, all through history, love storytellers and they value the story. Whoops, people in every culture love stories and they value the storytellers. I'm not gonna re-record this for every goof. So let's start with you reading the story. Ready, set, go. How are you doing? Did you enjoy that story? Are you chuckling and uh, giggling with laughter? Well, no. Everybody likes stories. What's the matter? The problem is you probably never learned to read German. I took two years of German in high school and I really couldn't read that very well. I had to ask for help. So let's see if I can help you. Snoopy types. It was a dark and stormy night. Then Lucy comes up and says, that's a miserable way to start a story. It's so corny. Once upon a time, that's how all good stories begin. Do it this way. Begin your story with once upon a time. Then Snoopy thinks and types once upon a time. It was a dark and stormy night. Did you like that better? How about this story? Can you tell the story from these markings? Some of you probably could read that and tell a story from it because you have learned how to recognize lines and circles and make music from them. But how about rocks? Do rocks talk? Do they tell us stories? Well, if you hold a rock up to your head, you won't hear much. Rocks can't talk, sorry, but they can tell us stories if we learn how to read them. So if we look at rocks close up and learn how to tell stories from that, we can read stories from rocks, just like we can from letters or notes. But how about a cave? Here's a poem that's gonna go in the book, I wrote it. A cave is a funny place to study. Whether you walk through or crawl, a cave is a hole, the lack of rock. So you're studying nothing at all. I used to tell friends, yeah, I went to grad school and I studied nothing for my thesis. Well, we can do better than that. So in the book, this is not an advertisement for the book. I've got so far 12 stories for how nature made the hole. Then I'll have another eight or 10 on how nature filled the hole with stalactites, stalagmites, etc. So today we're gonna to with the big three. Crater rocks, Rocky Mountain rocks. And that tells us how the limestone got there, how we got fractures in it. Then we're gonna kind of lump three together, <clears throat> how we get water into the rock to make the cave. So here's a way to think about the first one not always dark. When you think of a cave, you probably think of the darkness. We need electric lights to get through. 
or a flashlight or a headlamp. Lewis and Clark Caverns, they like to turn off the lights in the brown waterfall room so we can experience total darkness. It's pretty hard to do that anywhere else. But the Madison limestone the cave is carved from accumulated in the bright, hot sunshine of an ancient tropical sea. That's very different, isn't it? Looks something like this. Not always silent. On a cave tour, maybe they make everybody be quiet. It's hard because kids wiggle. Mommy. People shuffle their feet. But if you're by yourself in a cave, it can be really, really quiet. It's really hard to experience that anywhere else in our modern life. But when the Rockies formed, the rocks groaned and cracked during repeated earthquakes as the Rockies were born. This is Cave Mountain. We're going to be back to that pretty quickly. It's a really busy place geologically. A lot happened. We might think of caves as dry and dusty. You might think my clothes smell funny after being in a cave. Well, that's not the way they formed. Caves form when they're full of cool, cool clear spring water. This is uh, the springs at Blanchard Springs Cave in Arkansas. That's cave passage there. There's an abandoned cave passage here that used to be full of water. So let's talk about not always dark. The Madison limestone formed in an environment like this. This is the Bahamas today. Montana used to look like that repeatedly, not just for the Madison limestone, but for the Mar, the Pilgrim, the Jefferson. Repeated times, we had shallow tropical seas covering Montana and much of North America. Geologists like to say the present is the key to the past when we study rocks. So I'm looking at some old rocks here. What are those funny sticks? What are these funny wiggly lines? There's my size 13 foot for scale. Well, to understand the past, we need to look at the present. So I'm going to kick off my shoes, jump in the water and swim a short distance. Ah, isn't that pretty? Wouldn't you like to go? These are modern staghorn, no, elkhorn corals, Acropora cervicornis. Are you impressed? I don't see brain corals here, but in the previous picture, when those rocks formed, they formed underwater, and corals like these and others got broken off and fossilized. Limestones are bioclastic. Bio means like biology, they form from life processes. Clastic means broken or pieces or class, like the corals were alive, then they got busted up and turned into rock. A lot of rocks, sandstone and mudstone, originate up here in the continent. Um, maybe there's mountains, rivers carry sand and mud uh, down towards the ocean, downhill. They might dump some of the sand and mud along the river might form sandstone there or in the delta or along the shoreline or even off in deep water. The yellow sand, the brown is mud. So that's how sandstone and mudstones form from the weathering of rocks on the continent moving off into the ocean. Limestones are very different because they're bioclastic. The biology, the animals and plants and algae live here in the water that's land, this is sea. The biggest reefs form on the edge of the shelf where there's flat shelf drops into deep water. Lots of corals and other neat things here. Maybe some patch reefs. The whole shelf there can have lots of organisms cranking out limey sediments. Here's some stuff that looks like sand. Here's some sand. This is made out of mostly quartz from the rocks on the continent. These are all made out of shells and things from biological activities. A couple little clams here, a little tiny snail. That's sand that was manufactured here in the sea. Most of it was pushed onto land, a little bit off into deeper water. Here's another way to think about bioclastic. I love this quote. Limestones are made out of fossil corpses. It's a corpse. 
Well, it's the dead remains, the dead body. So most of the critters that make limestone are um, exoskeletons, invertebrate, they have invertebrates with exoskeletons. Their shells or their outer are their skeletons. When they die, those skeletons get made into limestone. They're corpses. But there's other critters that want to eat them. They munch on the shells to get the soft gooey part inside. So limestones are also made out of fossil garbage. That's the leftover stuff, food that didn't get eaten. What else happens? Limestones are made out of fossil sewage. Yep, the stuff that got eaten and digested, and some of it came out as fossil poop. That's another component of limestone. That's all made from simple marine invertebrates. I think Robin Bathurst, one of the great limestone guys, said that. I heard it in a class, but I can't find it in anything online. So I'll give credit to Robin. So again, this is what Montana looked like when the Madison limestone was deposited. Shallow, clear, tropical water, because that's where those organisms live and grow best. This white stuff is probably shallower water. Maybe it's some limey sands getting pushed over here by waves into the dark green. Maybe it's a little deeper. It's got grass on it. Ooh, look how pretty that water is. Here we have bioclastic sand. It's getting pushed by waves. You know, this big sand wave, little itty bitty ripples, that's getting pushed out into slightly deeper water. The little green lumps there are probably green algae that make fossil mud. This is Chulter's Keys in the Bahamas. Out here is the shelf edge dropping into deep water. There's reefs there. Um, the waves and storms bash on the reefs, push the sediments onto land. So this is all slightly underwater, that's above water, but it's loose lined sediments that are moved by the waves, the tidal currents. I was on a field trip here. We landed in a pontoon plane there to look at these sediments. Yep, that's me. This is a geology field trip for us, us to learn to understand about limestones. So I've got a towel on me trying to block the sun didn't work very well. I still got sunburned. Look, I'm wearing a necktie. This is a corporate business trip after all. I just did that to be silly. Cave Mountain, the cave is up about here, uh, is made up of limestone, Mississippian aged Madison limestone. The bottom part of it is kind of muddy, doesn't make big cliffs. That's the lower part of the Madison, the lodge pool. The bigger cliffs near the top are the Mission Canyon. That's cleaner, and that's where the caves throughout the Rockies form. Here's a close-up of the Lodge Pole limestone. Little streaks of brown mud. This was deposited in deeper water. Once in a while, storms would um, shake things around and uh, wash little layers of limey sand out into there. So the lodge pole is muddy, doesn't dissolve as easily. When it does, the mud would clog up and prevent caves from forming. The Mission Canyon is almost pure calcite or lime. Caves like that, this is where they form. And it also makes cliffs because it's much stronger than the muddy lodge pole. Most of the limestone in Lewis and Clark Caverns is here in the Mission Canyon. Because water could flow along the layers through cracks and dissolve it out. Just a little bit of the cave um, at the, at, by the exit tunnel, through the exit tunnel, we see the thin little muddy layers of uh, lodgepole limestone. That prevented the cave from going any deeper in that direction. Why do we call it Mississippian? Hey, we're in Montana. Well, one of the best places that they are exposed and described are along the Mississippi River. This is Illinois, Alt Alton, Illinois. Cross River is Missouri. Remember Tom Say, Tom Sawyer, Becky Thatcher in their cave? That's just upriver a little ways in Hannibal. Same limestone. It has very similar rock and fossils as what we have in Montana. 
This is the map of Montana when that limestone was deposited. There's Illinois and Iowa. That's the Mississippi River area. It's a very large area of North America covered by similar limestones, very similar fossils. The northeastern part of North America here is sandier and muddier because there was a continent collision going on then. But out here it was quiet and clean. Why do we call it Mississippian? You've probably heard of Jurassic, like Jurassic Park. Why do we have all these goofy names for rocks or rock ages? Well, that's based on the change of fossils. There's major extinctions, like the end of the Devonian, just before Mississippian started, 75% of all known species died off. Yikes. The end of the Cretaceous, when the dinosaurs died off, similar number. That one was probably caused by uh, meteorite impact. The end of the Devonian was caused by climate change. That was a global cooling. But the big one, end of the Permian, 96% of all species died off. Yikes. That's big picture. The individual periods, when we look at individual critters like crinoids, they're the ones who make up most of our limestone. In Devonian times, there were almost 700 species of crinoids. Most of them died off. Where's my cursor? the end of the Devonian. During Mississippian times, crinoids went crazy. There were over 2,400 species of crinoids. Sadly, those happy days ended. Most of them died off. Pennsylvania, only two or 300. So changes in fossil life define the geological time periods. In Lewis and Clark caverns, mostly fine little bits of crinoids. We don't see a lot of fossils. It's mostly this finite grain broken up bioclastic limestone. Those crinoids are about half an inch long. This is in the ceiling of Uncle Sam's room. Sometimes we see little plates here. That's probably the base of the body. We'll see that in a minute. It's a little subtle, but this little curly cue here, that's a little gastropod, a mold of a gastropod. Crinoids were the star of the show in Mississippian times. That's a pun because they're related to starfish. A friend of mine calls them starfish on a stick. The body is up on, mounted on a stem. There's little things like roots called holdfasts. But the body up here has a mouth, very simple digestive system. The end of the digestive system, we won't talk about that. And then it's got tentacles. And like a starfish, they're in groups of five. 5, 10, 15, or more. So that's why we call them starfish on a stick. Crinoids still live in the oceans today. Generally, it's just the body and the tentacles. Most of them aren't um, on stems any longer. Here's some crinoid stems in Mississippian rocks I collected in Crawfordsville, Indiana. That used to be one of the best places to find the bodies. I didn't find any of those. I just found the stems. But you can see a lot of different interesting variety of stems, and the individual stems break off into little pieces that same friend calls these fossil Cheerios. We call them ossicles, but that makes up a lot of the limestone in the Mississippian. These are rarely fossilized, but that's the body. These are the tentacles. See the cracks? Those are the plates, so when they die, that those break up. And maybe the critters that like to eat and munch on the crinoids want to get inside for the soft, fleshy part, the digestive system. Here's the stem. This is a sample at the Houston Museum of Natural History. These are two from Steve Mosher's collection. He used to teach at Bartlesville Wesleyan College. Look at those tentacles. Cool. There's the stem. The tentacles could actually move and stir water towards the mouth. They caught food like plankton. They could pass it down to the mouth. Here's some more from Steve Mosher. There's the body, and you can imagine they would crack and break up the tentacles and the stem. I wish I had some like that. These are living modern crinoids. This is in the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Ignore them, they're, they're corals. We talk about them next. Crinoids look like flowers or feather dusters. They're animals, they're carnivores. 
These ones are white. They usually don't survive in an aquarium. So I was lucky to get this picture because a couple of weeks later they were gone. A friend of mine, Mel Beckberger, shot these while scuba diving off Japan. That big bushy flowery thing is a crinoid. That's an animal. You get up real close. Thank you, Mel, for getting up close. We can see the tentacles. They come in all sorts of different colors today. We can imagine the ancient ones did too. Animals, not plants. They made up a lot of limestone. We also find coral fossils. These you see on the trail up to the cave. That's a cross section of a solitary horn coral. There's the length of it. Most of the limestone is bioclastic, busted to pieces. That's the tip of a pen for scale. I don't see many coral inside the cave. I've seen this one in the roof of Princess's Palace. This is a colonial coral. It's about an inch and a half, two inches across. Mostly see crinoids and not a lot of them. Corals are common in a lot of limestones, a lot of different ages. Modern corals are colonial. Each of those little bumps is a separate animal. Sometimes the bumps are bigger, colonial. And in the past, we had solitary corals. But they're really common in the rock record. These are the soft, fleshy business part of the corals. And then they can retract here when they're disturbed or they don't want to feed. These are related to jellyfish. Corals and jellyfish have stinging cells. So we assume the ancient corals did too. They really have a simple body plan. Um, no mouth, no digestive system. They have tentacles to stir the water, to catch prey, but each cell has to feed itself. So the body, the hollow body, can only be two cells thick. Wow. So what? Who cares about these silly fossils? Limestone dissolves in weak acids. That's where caves come from. So pardon the chemistry talk. Water plus carbon dioxide, a gas, a common gas, make carbonic acid. Calcite or limestone plus carbonic acid dissolves it into ions in, in the water, into liquid. In Geology 101 labs, we give the students a piece of limestone, dilute acid, they drop it on there, it fizzes. I have a friend who studies sandstone. He looks down on carbonate or limestone people. They study fizzy rocks. Fizzy rocks are fun too. So when rain falls through the atmosphere, it picks up carbon dioxide, makes a weak carbonic acid. Water is sitting in the soil, especially the organic part of the soil. There's a lot of biological activity there. The microorganisms respirate, they breathe, they uh, breathe out carbon dioxide so soil water gets to be very acidic and that gets into the limestone and dissolves it out to make a cave <clears throat> here's some limestone in missouri along the road cut there's some cracks here um, acidic groundwater got in there dissolved out the limestone just leaving these towers if we went up there with a pick and shovel dug in there maybe we could find a cave here it's probably full of clay and chert. Pretty neat, huh? I can do better than this. Let's go to Thailand. Wow. In Fangaw Bay in Thailand, the thick limestone used to be continuous. Water dissolved the cracks and just left that beautiful tower. If you ever saw the James Bond movie, Man with a Golden Gun, this is the one. That's where a solar collector came from. But looking around, all these big towers were carved or dissolved out of limestone that would continue all the way across there. So limestone is important. So when you think of a dark cave, or you're walking up to the cave and you see this boring gray limestone, think about the bright sunshine in a beautiful tropical sea with a limestone formed. Not always silent. When the Rockies formed, it was a noisy place. There were a lot of earthquakes, not constantly, but on and off, on and off as the rocks deformed. So mountain building forces tilted the rock layers. This is Cave Mountain looking west. 
the Sister Mission Canyon Limestone, the Muddy Lodge Pole. There might be a little bit of Sappington there for geologists who like the Sappington. Three Forks Shale makes the valley. Devonian, Jefferson Dolomite. This end has kind of folded up, so it's hard to see, but the rock layers there have been tilted steeply off the tobacco root mountains to the south. Mountain building forces faulted and folded these rocks that later, not, not yet, became Cave Mountain. So this is a diagram to explain that. On the backside of Cave Mountain, this red line, there's a big fault that raised these rocks a couple miles up over these. There's another big fault right here at the base that cuts through the canyon. Whoops, through there. That's a long one. That goes almost 20 miles to Three Forks. Cave Mountain, there's a fold in the rocks. We'll talk about it in a minute. Down here, this stuff, that's a mess. We don't need to worry about that. Why well, keep saying mountain building forces? How do mountain build, how mountains build? What happens? Since we all love the Rockies, that's why we go to Montana or live there, right? Wish I could live there. Let's take a quick detour and talk about mountains. This is a map showing in black the mountains in North America. The Rockies is a big chain. Canada through the U.S. and the Canada into Mexico. There's the coastal ranges, Cascades, and others. Over here's the Appalachians, the Wachita's. These are big features. Continental scale features require continental scale forces to make them. This is a map showing in black the mountains in Montana. Interesting, they kind of parallel the edge of the continent off to the west. Don't forget that. So the continents move. They're moving today. They've moved in the past. Back in Jurassic time, North America, there's Montana, was next to Greenland, Europe, Africa, and South America. Not just neighbors, they are all part of the same continent. There's some little pieces out here in the Pacific Ocean. The continents are broken apart and moved. So later in the Jurassic, North America started to split away from Africa. In Cretaceous times, uh, the South Atlantic started to open up. Oh, here's Montana. Now, North America's moving that way. What's going on over here? We have a space problem. This is in Eocene times, almost modern. This is what it looks like now. So North America's moved a long ways from where it used to be. This is a cross section as if we cut a, a big deep trench across the globe to look inside of it. So North America here, there's Montana, used to be up next to Africa, Greenland, and Europe. Over here in the Pacific, there's a long volcanic chain. Lavas came up there. Um, the Pacific plate moved that way and moved that way. So we had a little bit of a problem here as these little broken pieces of continent slammed into North America. It got worse. When the North Atlantic opened up, North America moved that way while the Pacific plate was moving that way. So we had a lot of compression there. It really squeezed the Earth's crust. That's how the Rockies formed. In the Cretaceous time, more Eocene times, uh, in modern day times. Now, um, this part of the East Pacific Plate has been consumed or melted under North America, so now we have uplift instead. But we're still splitting away from Europe or Africa. The rate is about an inch a year, about the rate your fingernails grow. Continents are still moving. Compressive forces from that folded and folded the bedrock in our area. This is Cave Mountain. We're looking northeast. There's a big fault on the back side. Another big fault underneath on the south side. The rock layers are really folded crazy. I'm going to show you a geological map superimposed on this. So the red line shows the big faults. Cave Mountain is almost surrounded by faults. Big folds and some funny, really tight folds. The rock was really smushed. 
but thank you, that gave us the Rockies. Here's a couple you can see around the area. This is in the canyon. Julia shot this picture for me last year. Couldn't find mine. These really old rocks of the hood been pushed up almost two miles over Younger Cambrian and uh, Permian and Mississippi age rocks. It's a big fault there, a little one there. Different people interpret this differently. Fine. In the Jefferson Canyon, here's a lodgepole limestone. There's the layers. Then they turn abruptly and turn again. And then they end here against the Jefferson Canyon fault. This is all the same color because it's the same rock. But look, that crazy tight fold. Rocks bend. Rocks break. From an airplane looking east, there's Cave Mountain Leander. It's just around the corner. There's this big fault, the cave fault here. The Le Hood rocks have moved up almost two miles vertically, and they've slid horizontally. There's another big fault underneath here. It does some funny things down there. This is a block diagram showing a little old cave mountain there. That's a little dinky fold compared to the other big folds nearby. But Jefferson Canyon Fault goes almost 20 miles, almost to Three Forks, turns north and hooks up with the disturbed belt, the overthrust belt that goes all the way up into Canada ultimately. So the rocks moved vertically and laterally or horizontally. That's a lot of movement. Hey, what about the cave? We all love the Rockies. What about the cave? Okay, back to the cave. Probably the first day of my thesis fieldwork, I was wondering, what do I do? Where do I start? So I walked around the back side of Cave Mountain. I hiked up to the top just to look around. I noticed the narrow crest of Cave Mountain went a long ways, half a mile. Then it seemed to turn. Is that just the way it was eroded? Where do the rocks actually bend? I just showed you there's a lot of bent rocks in the area. Well, geologists have a way to study that. So I spent many days with my Breton compass measuring the tilt of the rocks. So here I'm measuring which way and how much they're tilted, how they dip. This way I'm measuring the horizontal. We call that the strike. So do the rocks at Cave Mountain change direction 90 degrees or they just eroded. I had to take a lot of measurements to figure that out. By the way, when I took these pictures, I was standing in two feet of snow, so I hope you are grateful for that. So after measuring a lot of strike and dip, yeah, the layers bend into two right angles, something like this. They're tilted at 54 degrees. They bend just up above the switchbacks they turn back again the other side in the canyon. Cool. As I was doing that, I found one outcrop, short distance 50 feet, where the rock layers turn 90 degrees at a very short distance. That helped my mapping, but I also found there's a little cave there, right where the rock bent the most. Isn't that interesting? I named these the nasal passages. They only go down 60, 70 feet. Before I could explore them, I had to dig them out because they were full of pigeon poop. <clears throat> and I didn't want to die from suffocation of, from pigeon poop. Neither would you, right? We can really see this fold easily just on the tourist trail. Here in the thin bedded limestone, which is easier for seeing the dip in the strike. Yeah, it's really steep. Dipping that way, over here, the cave entrance is about there. The rock layers turn 90 degrees, just at the switchbacks. Interesting. That happens on the outside. What about inside the mountain in the cave? So when rock layers are bent and eroded, on Google Earth or on a geological map, they make parallel stripes. If the fold is also tilted, then they make the zigzag pattern. So this is a Google Earth image, and we can see the purple lines show the bending of the rock layers. 
Mission Canyon, down in the muddy lodge pole. The lowest part of the valley is the muddy Three Forks Shale. Oh, you can see it right there. Interesting. And I know now that the cave formed right at the major bend of that fold and on this side of it. I didn't know that then. I had to figure that out and prove it. So from an airplane, this is the bend right there. As I was poking around, there's a couple spots where the rock layers aren't parallel to that. They're all goofered up. That's in the lodgepole. I've since seen and learned in classes that muddy rocks are incompetent, like the lodgepole. All that mud makes it weak. So on Beaver Creek, in the Big Belts, there's a similar fold with Mission Canyon lodgepole. Right by the creek, the rocks are really contorted up. They're probably that way here. We just can't see them except for a couple little spots. Mountain building is a serious affair. Here's a deformation of Cave Mountain, how I interpret it. This is how it looks now. There is north, so we're looking mostly west. There's Cave Mountain in blue. That's the lodgepole dipping. There's a fault on the backside, fault below it, and the rocks tilt, tilt and twist. Let's look at in the past, just before the Laramide orogeny, when the rocks were deformed, this is what it looked like. The layers were flat. That's how they're deposited. The last thing to be deposited were almost two miles of volcanic sediments from the nearby Hillcorn Mountains. Those in the older rocks were tilted up as the tobacco root mountains started to form. Whammo! Then this stuff moved up and laterally along the Jefferson Canyon Fault. This block moved up over the limestones of the future cave mountain and everything was folded too. It's a busy place. Then that was eroded down to get our modern landscape like this. So again, there's cave mountain in the entrance to the cave. Maybe it's sloppy presentation style for me to leave this behind that. Maybe it's distracting, but I want to emphasize there's been a lot of erosion to get our modern landscape. Oh, I wish I had Google Earth back in the old days. This is Google Earth, the upper visitor center. There's a cave entrance. Exit. How much of Cave Mountain do you think the cave is on? Well, I already gave you a hint. But I had to do a lot of work outside and inside to figure that out. And it's really only a very small part of Cave Mountain that has the cave that we know about. Don't ask. There's probably some more cave, but dang, we have looked and looked and looked. When rocks fold like potato chips, they don't like it. They break, especially along the hinge. And folded rocks fracture in fairly predictable patterns. There's my size 13 foot again. They form Fractures can form in predictable patterns. My teammate and good friend at Phillips Petroleum, Bonnie, had mapped um, her thesis area in the same area as me, the same time as me, but for Indiana University. I didn't know that. She studied and measured all the fractures on the big folds and put them in a computer program, and she interpreted the dominant fracture direction with these two planes here. But there's other fracture patterns too. So I would expect that one, but Bonnie did the work, so I gotta trust her. This is a little fold in the big belts again on Beaver Creek. It looks kind of like the fold, smaller version at Cave Mountain. You can see there's a lot of cracks or fractures here. So the blue show the folded layers, the red show the fractures, and there's some little cave openings here right along the hinge or the axis of the fold. I've been there twice, always on different missions, never had time to run up the hill. Uh, it's a long, steep hill. To look in there, I don't think those go back very far, but it's interesting. Water got into the cracks along the hinge of the fold and dissolved out some little cave openings. So the Mission Canyon limestone and Cave Mountain fracture the most along that hinge and along the layers. Because when you think about rock layers or pages of a paperback book, as they bend, they slide past each other. The red stuff here. 
So I spent a lot of time in the cave, darn it, with my brunt compass trying to find rock layers where I could measure the strike and dip. And it turns out the two biggest rooms, Cathedral Room and the Paradise Room, here in red, are right on the bend, the hinge of the fold. They're almost on top of each other. They have similar sizes and shapes. Isn't that a cool coincidence? So here I'm looking down into the Cathedral Room, uh, the Paradise Room, excuse me. Cathedral Room is drier. I think something was wrong with my camera that day because it's not that white. So the biggest rooms in the cave formed on the hinge. Most of the passages we see on the tour formed parallel to the layers, but where the layers slid past each other. So this map shows in purple those passages that formed along the layers. Out here in the hills, I figure, that's only a guess. That area is a mess that's all collapsed and caved in. So there are a lot of places we can see the tilted layers, measure strike and dip. This is going up to the fish tunnel in the cathedral room. This is at the top of the star spiral stairway shaft. So that's there on the map. That's over here on the map. So most of the cave passage we see formed parallel to the layers. Some places we can't see the actual layers, but doggone it, the shape of the cave, cave passage, it's really clear. That's at the entrance. This is Garden of the Gods. So there and there. As the rock layers slid past each other along the layers, it ground up the rocks, something awful. Think about rug burn. This is rock burn. So we call these slick insides, where the rocks are ground up and polished. We call this fout gouge, where the rocks are just pulverized by friction and all the weight of the uh, force of that movement. So that's probably what caused most of the cave to form along those. There's a few passages here, mostly around the Brown Waterfall Room, headed off to the Paradise Room, and probably some of Hills Half Acre I really don't want to talk about today. We can see the layers, but there's joints or fractures that cut across them. In fact, all the passages from here on, going to the Paradise Room, follow the fractures instead of the layers. So that's this red plane. If we turn around, this is in the Brown Waterfall Room, head into the Poison Rock, the rock layers are dipping, tilted down towards us, but the cave passage follows these vertical joints. I try to draw it here. I don't know. Does that work? It's kind of busy. You, you might remember in the cave tour, you walk under poison rock. Do you know why they call it poison rock? One drop will kill you. This is my map of the cave. How do you draw and communicate? Such a complicated mess as that. Well, I put in a few cartoons and cross sections. I can color code it and put on lines to show a little geology. Not good enough. Way back when somebody made this nifty clay model, this thing's probably older than me, that shows the major rooms and passages. Doesn't really show the geology. Interesting, but not good enough. So I did some paper doll geology and put this in the training manual for the tour guides years ago. Sheet of paper with a cave drawn on it and you just fold it. So that shows tilted layers and the two big rooms kind of over each other on the hinge of the fold. It's not quite that simple, but it's a good first approximation because they're not all just in a single thin layer of the limestone. I tried building a plexiglass model with three layers. I'm good with woodwork. I am not good with plexiglass. The glue failed, the tape failed. I made a big dent in my kitchen table, but you get the idea. Can we do better? Back in thesis days, I just tried doing a three-dimensional drawing. It puts everything in approximately the right vertical position so we can see the cave is very steep and deep, but it still doesn't show the geology right. It's anatomically incorrect, geologically incorrect, because it doesn't show the layers. Nonetheless, just on a whim, I sent it into the National Speleological Society Cave Map Salon, and I won a blue ribbon. 
Since then, I've redrawn it, now showing a framework of the tilted layers, that they're bent, and that there's more than one skinny layer that the K forms. So the second layer, a little bit farther, I try to draw those passages lighter. I like that better. This is not the direction we would see from the visitor center. The visitor center is way off that direction, so we'd be looking that way. We'll look at that later, I promise. When they recently put in the new lights in the cave, uh, the contractors had to survey, resurvey the cave, so they knew how much cable and light fixtures and things. So they graciously gave me their data in the modern uh, mapping software Compass, where they did all their mapping. It didn't used to be this easy. So that's the map of the cave. Go back. Click. This is the map of the cave. If I click on it, we can rotate this down vertically. So now we're seeing a cross section of the cave. Ooh. This is the exit tunnel. That's about the angle we would see from the visitor center. I'm going to stop right here. So there's the entrance. Nope, there's the entrance. Today, that's the historical entrance you look up at. We'll go down and look down the spiral stairway shaft down to the beaver slide, up into the cathedral room. This mess is a hell's half acre. It's all collapsed. Down to the lower cathedral room. The cave ended there, so they blasted the connecting tunnel to the bottom of the pit. Halfway room. Down to the Garden of the Gods. Crystal pool. Down to the brown waterfall room. Cathedral room, paradise room. To see those, we need to rotate it. So now we're on the other side of the fold to understand these passages, about there. Paradise room, paradise room and below, cathedral room. These lines are just the survey lines. They don't flash out the entire passage of the entire room. There's the exit tunnel. Does that help to visualize the cave? Yeah, we can do better. Now we're gonna color code the cave the red is the highest, and as we rotate it, we can put a box around it, a vertical box, to help see it in 3D space better. And then the cave in blue is projected onto those walls. Isn't that fun? Highest part of the cave, lowest part of the cave. The cave is about 600 feet deep. I hope you're enjoying this and not getting bored. I only have three or four more of these. Then we put it back onto the map view. That's great. It still doesn't show the geology, the importance of the dipping layers. So here's another model. All I've got is a framework showing the layers. Yeah, it's kind of dark, but hey, the cave is dark too. So now we can rotate that so that shows the layers are tilted and bent into two folds. That's about the view from the visitor center that we're looking up. This is about the view I had to do for the 3D cave drawing. But the cave didn't form along a single layer. So now I'm such a nerd, huh? I built four layers and I drew the top of, of the inner and outer ones darker. I'm doing this so you can visualize, get in your brain, the tilted fold, folded layers before I put the cave in there. This is complicated stuff to visualize. So now we're gonna do that. The cave passages are color coded according to what layer approximately they fall in. Now we're going to rotate it down, look straight down the layers. 
So most of the cave is in the very bottom layers of the Mission Canyon. There's 300 feet for scale. So the cave goes through three or 400 feet of the limestone. The lodge pole starts about there. Hills half acre goes up into much younger layers. Now that you have seen that and can start to visualize it, I'm going to do it now zoomed in so we can see the cave better. That's about the view I draw the cave map, but it also heck, half acre would have been in the way so I couldn't draw it. Else half acre is very different. So here's the entrance to the spiral stairway shaft all the way to the cathedral room and the ash hall probably goes much farther that way but it's plugged up. The middle layer of the cave um, down the halfway room are in blue, slightly older layer. Garden of the Gods, Paradise Room are more in these deepest layers. I colored that red and pink. And the lodge pole limestone where the cave stops and can't go any further is about there. Hope this helps. And if you've been in the cave one time, you're probably saying, this guy is such a nerd. No, I'm not. I'm an interesting person. People ask, why didn't you make your drawing from the angle of the visitor center? Well, this is a cave map with the same color coding. We're going to rotate it down to Horus. Whoops, we're going to rotate it first. That's about what it looked like from the visitor center if we're up on an airplane. There's 100 feet from there there at the end of the exit tunnel to the visitor center is half a mile, so it's way, way off my map. But if we rotate this down just to horizontal, that's all I'm going to do. That's kind of what the cave would look like. And I could draw this stuff, but you don't get, you don't visualize the dipping layers as well. Who cares? That's why I did it that way. So the cave today is very quiet. When I was in there working by myself, sometimes, usually I was with the people, but sometimes I could do things by myself. It was really quiet. But when the rocks were deformed, when the great Rockies grew, there was a lot of noise, a lot of earthquake. As the rocks were bent and broken. We also think maybe if the cave is dry, maybe your clothes smell dusty when you get out of the cave. Don't think of only dry and dusty. When caves formed, when caves are formed today in the Ozarks, we can see cool, clear, beautiful spring water coming out of the cave. This is Blanchard Springs Cave in Arkansas. This is where the cave discharges. There's an old cave passage that used to carry water. I like this quote from Michener, only the rocks live forever. Interesting. But the rocks don't live forever. The rock cycle tells us rocks melt and reform. Rocks get metamorphosed, form new rocks. Rocks get eroded. Sediments get transported to make sandstone lime. Anyway, rocks don't live forever. Sorry. The mountains don't live forever either. They're made of rocks. Mountains don't live forever, sad to say. John Montaigne, my thesis advisor, put it this way. After the mountains stopped forming, they were buried up to their ears in the sediments eroded from them. This is the way I would say it. The mountains drowned in their own debris. Through much of central Montana, Wyoming, we drive through flat prairie land. I call that mountain graveyard because the mountains are buried. They're eroded off flat and buried underneath the flat landscape. Here's an example. This is central Montana. We're up in an airplane. There's a little ranch, the highway. The landscape is really flat. There's a couple little itty bitty ridges. They aren't very big. But underneath this flat landscape, there's a 4,000 foot fault. Rocks over here in Devil's Basin 
They've been uplifted 4,000 feet higher than the rocks here. They've just been all eroded flat, like a lot of the Rockies were. And they were buried by um, rivers and streams that have eroded sediments off the mountains and a lot of volcanic ash that blew in. So a lot of our younger valley fill sediments that bury the Rockies are this loose volcanic ash. Some of this stuff is hundreds or thousands of feet thick in the valleys. If this looks a lot like the Badlands, east of the Black Hills, bingo. Similar rocks, similar age, similar fossils, similar ways they're deposited. This is the way I interpret how our landscape formed. We're looking southeast. This is the town of Cardwell out in the Jefferson Valley. There's Three Forks. There's the Jefferson River. Cave Mountain is right there. This is the Jefferson River Canyon and the front of the London Hills. That's what it looks like today. The orange are younger sediments. The yellow are the modern river sediments. At the end of the first mountain building, the Laramide orogeny, maybe it looked like this. The colors represent the different rock ages. That doesn't matter so much now, but the rocks were broken up along these big red lines, big, big faults that moved miles and littler faults. Some big folds and some little tight folds. The future cave mountain is about there. The Rockies were eroded and buried. That's what all this orange stuff stands for. Rivers did all of that. There's probably some little knobs here and there of the water rocks. I'm just going to color them all brown now, stick it up. But the landscape was pretty flat and mostly buried by younger sediments. And things got interesting again. Later on, the rocky mountain area was uplifted, started to get pulled apart. So we have different kinds of faults forming, extension or pull apart form faults. So the London Hills just barely started to form and the Jefferson River said, hey, wait a minute, we could keep up for a while and wrote it down through the uplifting blocks. Faulting continued and the Jefferson River had no choice, it just kept cutting down its canyon. Sometime in this history of the canyon cutting, good things happen. Yay, this is when the cave formed. It's about time, isn't it? Yes. The cave formed as the Jefferson River cut its canyon um, right after the rocks, the London Hills were uplifted along that fault. And that's what it looks like today. Again, there is Cave Mountain. The cave now is way too high for the Jefferson River to get any more water. So that's why we walk through it instead of scuba dive through it. Let's talk about that fault for just a minute. I call it the Star Stitch Fault. This is London Hills looking east. Um, there's Cave Mountain, the Jefferson River Canyon. So this abrupt change of landscape from flat to mountains in a straight line suggests a fault. The change cuts straight across rock layers going that way. They were cut by a fault. Looking from an airplane or aerial photographs, I noticed this long linear feature. That's I-90. That's Highway 2 into the canyon. Maybe that's an old fault scarp that's partly buried by the alluvial fan or pediment on top of it. So I walked along that. There's the younger alluvial fan that cut some of it. That could be a fault scarp. Let's go a little closer. Wow, there's a lot of slick insides, broken pieces of rock where fault and moved it. Interesting. That suggests that's a fault scarp. But wait, there's more. Nearby, the younger valley fill sediments that were deposited by the streams had been deposited flat. Now they tilt steeply into the fault. They're deposited flat when the fault moved. They were down dropped as the London Hills popped up. So there's sand, gravel, sand, and volcanic ash. I've been trying to find a lab who can age date that volcanic ash because that tells us the maximum age of the faulting in the canyon in the cave. I can't find a lab that'll do it. I'm still looking. 
So these faults, these bullet part faults, are really common in the Northern Rockies. Right around the corner, here's the tobacco roots looking south. Out to the east, the Beartooth Mountains, lifted up over Paradise Valley. Here's an alluvial fan, and the fault scarp cuts that. The faulting is very young, less than 10, 15,000 years. In 1959, the Great Hepkin Lake earthquake offset the Madison Range by 15, 20, 25 feet and left this scarp. It's still happening today, folks. The Teton Range has uplifted 20, 30,000 feet. We can see fault scarps like this one in Young Sediments. These faults and uplifts are really common. This is a map of Mon Western Montana, Idaho. I compiled this from a lot of sources. The green show the trace of the compressional faults where they're squished together during the Laramide orogeny, the first episode of faulting. The red show the later faults, the pull apart ones. And the blue is the one that formed the London Hills. So if there's a lot of these, they parallel the old ones probably exploited the old ones. This orange here shows where the Yellowstone hotspot, there's Yellowstone, has migrated through time and paused and had different volcanic eruptions. And that probably caused a lot of these faults too. The Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology has mapped over 14,000 earthquakes in Montana since 1982. So it's still happening today. Mountains are still forming, yay, but we don't like earthquakes. In addition to that, deep meandering canyons like the Jefferson Canyon have cut through many hills and mountains of the Rockies. Cave entrance is right there. This canyon is about 1,400 feet deep. Wow. These canyons are common. This is the Horseshoe Bends on the Missouri, just downstream, the Bighorn Canyon, it's a thousand feet deep. Look at those crazy meanders. Black Canyon of the Gunnison in Colorado, 2,000 feet deep. Yeah, there's a river down there. Um, the Narrows in Zion, 1,000 feet deep. I love this. The Goosenecks of the San Juan. You know, Fires River, and I had to go through the rock and want to go from here to there, the straight line. They follow these crazy meandering patterns. Why do they do that? One of the classics is this little dude on the Jefferson, just downstream of the ca caverns. Why did the cave, the, the river, cut through that hard rock hill, there's a river, rather than this easy flat stuff out here? Well, it was trapped. In the geological past, when the Rockies first formed, the layers were tilted, folded into some beds, bends. The layers here are folded up into vertical. That was a rotor down pretty flat. Rivers meandered across there, deposited sand and mud and ash, but then the river started to cut down again. And then they excavated the landscape. The river was trapped in that valley, that canyon, and cut that goofy little canyon. There's a lot of these big and little all through the Rockies. The rivers have eroded a lot of sediment. This is the modern Jefferson River near Three Forks, 10 miles away on the top of Beacon Hill, a thousand feet higher than us, we find pretty young river sediments. That used to be the bottom of the river system. All of those sediments in the valleys have been eroded away, washed downstream to the Gulf of Mexico. The sediments are really, really thick down there. We can find river boulders along I-90 at a high elevation north of the cave. If we walk these out, of course I did that. Here we are in an airplane. They're up at an elevation here, almost 5,750 feet, which is higher than the entrance to Lewis and Clark Caverns, about there at 5,600 feet. So when the river was there, there's a much wider river valley. That was the bottom of the valley. Cave Mountain was still covered. This hadn't been exposed yet. Later the river meandered over there, cut the canyon, cut Sheep Gulch to create Cave Mountain. When the cave started to form, the Jefferson River Canyon probably looked like this near the Missouri headwaters. Just cut down 100 feet or so. Flat area nearby, 
uh, rainfall would flow across that through the rock into the river. Now the Jefferson River is cut down 1,300, 1,500 feet. So the cave up here is high and dry. Doesn't have much water go through it, just little drips. Water used to flow from this flat valley down into the new Jefferson Canyon through the tilted layers to form the cave. When erosion cuts sheep gulch, that cut off the supply of water and the cave drained and died. Here's a cartoon. So the limestone, Madison limestone, deposited a long time ago in Mississippian times. It was buried for a long, long time. When the London Hills were raised along the fault, the Jefferson River started to cut its canyon. Yay, finally the cave started to form. When erosion cut sheep gulch, that cut off the supply of water to the cave. It dried out, it drained, and it collapsed. When the cave formed, it was full of water. We see a lot of round cave passages that tell us they were full of water. There was a short episode with a small cave stream, it deposited three, four, five feet of sand and silt. It's volcanic ash in the cathedral room. If I could get that dated, if I could find a lab to help me, that would tell us when that stream floated to the cave. That'd be really neat to know. Found a pretty young lake, deer lake bone in there too. So when the cave formed, a cartoon of the cathedral room, paradise room, is full of water. When the water drained, the water does add some buoyancy support to the cave. So the ceiling collapsed, the cave passage or the room is moved up as the floor filled in. Nowadays, as we walk into those rooms, that's the only two spots in the cave tour where we go up because we're climbing up the boulder pile into the cathedral room, paradise rooms. The original cave floor is down 50 or 100 feet. So draining of the cave caused massive collapse of the ceilings in most of the big rooms and especially Hell's a Half Acre. Hell's a Half Acre could be four or 500 feet deep now yeah, three or four hundred feet deep of boulders like this. There's Bob, a person, a little bitty person, up there at the top. That's the end of the big three stories, but I just got to say, the cave is better known for its speleothems. Ah, speleothems. That's many more stories. These are holactites. Most caves don't have holactites. They're very unusual. Lewis and Clark Evans has thousands. Caverns of Sonora, Texas has millions. They fascinate me. Why do we have so many? Why do they mostly grow up? Look at this groovy one. It grew, curled, connected back to the cave wall. Why do they do that? So I confess, I am growing artificial halactites out of copper sulfate because they grow faster in a bathroom upstairs. There's an individual one, a little tiny droplet of water at the top. I'm still trying to understand the lactites better. Am I a nerd? I hope not. I'm just an interesting person. And that's all the interesting stories I have for right now. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Bye. Have you tried to use the CAD program like the ones architects use? No, because um, I'm quite happy with the compass program and somebody else did all the work, surveyed it, used that program um, to interpret it. Back in the old days, we used compasses. We wrote down the numbers on ditto sheets. We used our handheld calculator with trick functions to figure out the X, Y, and Z, and then hand drew it. I haven't tried CAD programs. Um, in compass, rather than just draw the straight lines to connect the survey points, there are some ways of trying to show the cave passages. Um, somebody from Western came in with a laser, a rotating laser, tried an experiment to do full three-dimensional rendering some of the passages. That would be cool. 
That'd be a heck of a lot of work. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, we got another one. How far into your research did you discover the nasal passages? Pretty early on. Because I first was doing the work outside the cave, when I started to recognize, hey, there's a fold here, I, I needed to map it more thoroughly, and that's when I ran into the nasal passages. And as I mapped and understood, there's a fold on the outside of the cave, there's got to be one inside. I wonder what that has to do with the cave. The nasal passages gave me a good hint that it probably had a lot to do with it. Okay. Approximately, when did LNCC move from being a wet cave to a dry cave? It's hard to date the timing of, of that. If I could get an age date on some speleothems coating, coating boulders in Hell's Half Acre, that would tell us when that part of the cave was still flooded. We have not destroyed or broken any speleothems for any matrix age dating. If we could age date that ash in the cathedral room, that would also tell us later on, after the cave drained, what little cave stream was still able to flow in there. Don't have those ages yet. If the cave formed maybe in the last five million years, that's my best guess. Probably the early in the canyon cutting is when most of the cave formed. The rivers had to cut down a long, long way since then. Cave is maybe 600 feet deep. Canyons maybe 1,400 feet deep. Thank you. Good question. Next. Okay, Julia wants to know: How do you have uh, do you have instructions available on how to grow helictites at home? I got this idea from a 1940 Journal of Geology article by Lyman C. Huff. Um, he used copper sulfate, sodium thiosulfate, and another one um, that's nasty, so I'm not going to use it. Um, anyway, so I tried that in grad school, had great success early on, and I can tell you how to do it. You can look up that article. It's, it's interesting. It's been a lot of fun doing it. I'm still trying to understand why they go up my latest batch didn't go up, they went sideways and other goofy things. So they blew up all my preconceived ideas from my earlier successes. So I've still got a lot to learn. I would like to put a stop action cam on it, click, 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 so we can show them growing. And I'm having trouble getting the very tip and focus on the key pictures. I'll help you with that, Julia. I'm sure she appreciates it. Uh, Kevin wants to know, uh, do you think the cave continues below the Paradise Room? Well, yes, it does. We have found rooms in the boulders there. So that's the Goat's Walk, the Clow Room. Stratigraphically speaking, the cave couldn't go much deeper um, down section or down towards where the exit tunnel is, because it gets in, into the, uh, um, the lodgepole limestone. I think there's a lot more cave that we can still find at that same level off the Brown Waterfall Room, because there's vertical fractures heading to the west that way. I have spent a lot of time looking there, looking around, have not found that those passages go that way. There's very annoying rumors that the Civilian Conservation Corps cemented shut passages that went that direction. That's my best guess for the most likely place for more cave passage. Thanks. Next. Okay. I think this is probably our last question uh, from Dorothy. Did anyone ever live in the cave? There's no record that Lewis and Clark 
ever discovered the cave, when it was named a national monument by Teddy Roosevelt, he said, hey, wait a minute, this is a hundred year anniversary, anniversary of the Lewis and Clark Exhibition. Nothing significant has been named for them. So we'll name this, that time, National Monument after Lewis and Clark. There's no record of, of Indians or Native Americans going in the cave, no petroglyphs, no old fire remains. Um, in their beliefs, going up was ascending towards heaven, going down into caves was ascending into hell. So they, there's no record that Native Americans lived there. Okay. Well, that was awesome, Rich. I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else did too. Thank you so much for volunteering and being a speaker with us um, and for letting us record. Um, that was so awesome. I can't wait to watch uh, the replay already <laughs> and catch more stuff that I probably missed. Um, but Great. thank you for speaking. I'm really glad to have you. I was delighted to get the chance. That was a great study many years ago, and I'm still having lots of fun, still figuring things out.